chapter 9, one final go at it to wrap it up. So let's begin with a prayer in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Let's take a moment to recollect ourselves in the presence of Almighty God and invite the Holy Spirit to open our hearts and minds. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady, Seat of Wisdom, pray for us. St. Jerome, pray for us. St. John, pray for us. All right, now, uh, one thing I want to point out to you is, I uh, don't think I mentioned this before but it's interesting when they say uh give god the praise when they when the pharisees put the blind man on the spot in verse 24 they say they said to him give god the praise we know that this man is a sinner so that's kind of a funny expression give god the praise uh but that's actually a jewish formulaic expression i found out um <clears throat> for obligating somebody to tell them to tell the truth okay uh kind of like saying fess up uh so this expression give god the praise uh comes up um uh, in joshua chapter 7 Verse 19, so I just want to look at that real quick with you. Um, similar situation where they're trying to get somebody to divulge something here. It's Joshua, and he's uh, interrogating Akon, who ends up getting stoned to death, okay? Um, so kind of a gruesome situation here, but Joshua uh, says, Then Joshua said to Akon, my son, give glory to the God, uh, sorry, my son, give glory to the Lord God of Israel and render praise to him and tell me what you have done. Do not hide it from me. Um, anyway, all right. So that's an interesting little uh, tidbit there, a little morsel that I didn't want to skip over. Uh, now, Let's um, let's notice here back in John 9 that uh, uh, what the blind man says is true when he says, uh, why, why this is a marvel. You do not know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. Uh, never since the world began has it been heard that anyone has opened the eyes of a man born blind. Now, that's at least true from the perspective of the Bible. Uh, there are no cases of the healing of a man born blind other than this one. All right. Uh, Tobit had his uh, vision healed or restored, uh, but it was also lost in the story from the drippings of the birds into his eyes out by the city walls. Uh, but he is, uh, he's later, his vision is restored. So anyway, that's a true statement. Um, anyway, just wanted to, uh, uh, point that out. And then this is interesting when they say to him, uh, when he busts them out and says, do you too want to be his disciples? And they say, you are his disciples. We are disciples of Moses. But that question, when he says it that way, do you too, or do you also want to be his disciples? The implication there is that this man, the blind man, is saying, I'm a disciple. Okay, and that's exactly what St. Augustine points out. Uh, Augustine says, what means, what does this mean, do you also, but that I am one already. Uh, so anyway, that's kind of cool. Now, this business here of God does not listen to sinners. Um, 
We know that God does not listen to sinners. That's a statement here of the blind man. Is that true? Is that a true statement? Yes and no. Yes and no. Uh, a sinner who's hardened his heart and who who is unrepentant, who has a reprobate conscience, will God listen to his prayers? Is an interesting question. Um because there is evidence uh, to support the conclusion can be drawn from the scriptures that God does not listen to sinners. If somebody is unrepentant, there's a separation that occurs. Um, and God will not listen to that person. Um, but yet, God does in fact listen to sinners who are repented for crying out loud. Look at the... Uh, tax collector in the story or parable that our Lord puts forward in Luke chapter 18 where he puts these two frames side by side of the Pharisee and the tax collector and guess who went home justified the tax collector who beat his breast and said God be merciful to me a sinner okay and God heard his prayer and listened to him so key here is uh, that when we say that God does not listen to sinners. When this blind man says that, uh, we have to be uh, careful about that. He doesn't listen to sinners. When the scriptures speak of sinners, uh, I think the implication is usually, oftentimes, in the Psalms and whatnot, of uh, the wicked, okay? Those who are unrepentant. Now, uh, I want to just read a couple quotes, one from Aquinas here. Uh, he quotes Augustine, or he cites Augustine, saying, Augustine says that this blind man is speaking as one who has not been anointed, as one who does not yet have complete knowledge. For God does hear sinners. Otherwise, it would have been futile for the tax collector to have prayed, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Accordingly, if we wish to save the statement of the blind man, we must say that God does not hear those sinners who persist in sinning, but he does hear those sinners who are sorry for their sins and who should be regarded more as repentant than sinners. God listens to the repentant. Um, and there's a good uh, text here I want to read from Second Chronicles. Uh, chapter 6, verses 36 and to 39. Uh, listen to this. If they sin against thee, for there is no man who does not sin. So if God's going to listen to any of us for crying out loud, unless you're the Blessed Virgin Mary, okay, we're all sinners. Um. God must listen to sinners. If they sin against thee, for there is no man who does not sin, and thou art angry with them, and dost give them to an enemy, so that they are carried away captive to a land far or near, yet if they lay it to heart in the land to which they have been carried captive and repent, and make supplication to thee in the land of their captivity, saying, We have sinned and have acted perversely and wickedly. If they repent with all their mind and with all their heart in the land of their captivity, to which they were carried captive and pray toward their land, which thou gavest to their fathers, the city which thou hast chosen and the house which I have built for thy name, then hear thou from heaven thy dwelling place, their prayer, and their supplications, and maintain their cause, and forgive thy people who have sinned against thee. That's beautiful prayer of Solomon here. Um, all right, now let's look at a, another quote here from Aquinas. He said, there's a difficulty here, because it's clear that miracles are not accomplished by us due to our own power. I mean, that's clear. Uh, that's what makes it a miracle, okay? Uh, but they're accomplished through prayer. 
Miracles are accomplished by the power of God through prayer. But sinners often perform miracles. Hence, um, our Lord here um, in Matthew seven twenty two. You know when he teaches about how you know not everyone who says to me, "Lord, Lord," will enter the kingdom of heaven. It says here, uh, "Lord, Lord," did we not prophesy in your name and do many mighty works in your name, and yet God did not know them. I do not know you. And yet they seemingly did mighty works um, in his name and prophesied in his name, but God does not know them. So to say that God doesn't listen to sinners um, doesn't seem to be the case um, that God doesn't listen to sinners. If they're repentant, he listens to them. And even if they're unrepentant, Aquinas says there's a difficulty here. Um, there is a, it is possible uh, that uh, God could listen to a sinner who's even unrepentant. Uh, but they would not merit anything for themselves by doing so. Okay. Um, it would not accrue to their holiness. It would not redound to their holiness if they did so. Uh, but God could allow himself to be moved by this. Uh, it would seem, it would appear. God's not limited uh, by that simple fact. Um, now, he could do nothing. He could do nothing. Yeah, that's that's interesting. If a man isn't from God, um, there's texts we could look at. But I, I think I want to move on and talk about the boldness of this guy's testimony. You know, I want to look at some catechism quotes because we could really use a, a shot in the arm. You know, uh, some boldness uh, would be a good thing, grace to receive from studying John chapter 9 to just receive a little infusion of this guy's boldness. Um, we have to be bold. Uh, what's the word for that in Greek? Paracrate. Para. Uh, uh, you don't want me to look that word up, do you? But it's in the Acts of the Apostles quite a bit. Uh, the idea of uh, preaching uh, boldly is, uh, yeah, I can't remember where I, it's used repeatedly in the Acts of the Apostles. Dang, blast it. Uh, Yeah, Parasia. One, two, three, four, five times uh, in uh, the Acts of the Apostles. Parasia. All right, let's get into the Catechism. All right, paragraph 904 is really powerful. Christ fulfills this prophetic office, not only by the hierarchy, but also by the laity. He accordingly both establishes them as witnesses and provides them with the sense of the faith and the grace of the word. So, your prophets, folks, and all of us who are uh, studying this, I happen to be wearing a white thing around my neck and I uh, had to go through six years of seminary and be evaluated by superiors and formation faculty and go through all that rigmarole 
survived living in a fishbowl for six years um, and uh, was ordained a priest by Mother Church. A bishop laid hands on my head, put oil on my hands. and uh, But look, uh, <clears throat> you all are sharers in this prophetic office when we're baptized. We're baptized into Christ. Priest, prophet, and king. As, a, as the Lord was anointed priest, prophet, and king, so may you live always as a member of, member of his body, sharing everlasting life. So uh, we share this prophetic office. And that means, catechism goes on, to teach in order to lead others to faith is the task of every preacher and of each believer. Lay people also fulfill their prophetic mission by evangelization. That is, the proclamation of Christ by word and the testimony of life. So both. This guy is so bold in this chapter. We need an infusion of that boldness, that parousia is the Greek word used in the Acts of the Apostles repeatedly, but uh, boldness is a distinguishing mark of the believer, of the true believer, uh, who is open and receptive to this grace of the Holy Spirit to be a prophet, a uh, testimony of life, yes, but also to be able to open our mouth sometimes and speak. Uh, so this is a good uh, quote here. Uh, from the Second Vatican Council cited in the Catechism, this witness of life, however, is not the sole element in the apostolate. The true apostle is on the lookout for occasions of announcing Christ by word, either to unbelievers or to the faithful. Right? We're prophets, we're evangelists, evangelists. This is part of our apostolate, folks. We are apostolic, uh, the, all of us, the whole church. So don't put it on us. You all have a peculiar efficacy because you go out there into all the layers of strata of society. And uh, I'm here in the rectory, okay? You have to think of yourself as an evangelist. Uh, I'm telling you this right now. Paragraph 816, 1816. The disciple of Christ must not only keep the faith and live on it, but also profess it, confidently bear witness to it and spread it. All, however, must be prepared to confess Christ before men. It's great. That's exactly what this guy is doing here. Uh, it's pretty cool. He's getting the heat. They're putting the heat on big time. And uh I'll tell you, he's going to be rewarded for that. Paragraph 2471. Before Pilate, Christ proclaims that he has come into the world to bear witness to the truth. The Christian is not to be ashamed then of testifying to our Lord. In situations that require witness to the faith, the Christian must profess it without equivocation after the example of St. Paul before his judges. Uh, all right, so boldness. Then what does he get for his boldness? Well, they cast him out, but our Lord said that would happen. If they hate me, they, if they persecute me, they're going to persecute you. Some of you are going to get thrown out. We mentioned that last time. You know, our Lord told us this would happen. Uh, now, they cast him out. Yeah, Luke chapter 6, verse 22. Uh, in these beatitudes of, uh, of St. Luke, blessed are you when men hate you and when they exclude you and revile you. It's exactly what they do to this guy. They hate him. They uh, exclude him. They cast him out. And they revile him. Okay? But blessed are you when they do that. And cast you out. Cast out your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Who's about to introduce himself. We'll see here shortly. Uh, 
reintroduce himself to this blind man who's going to lay eyes on him for the very first time. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for so their fathers did to the prophets. All right, now, he's going to approach him now and say, uh, let's go back here. He finds him, Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? Now, some ancient authorities have Son of God. Do you believe in the Son of God? I noticed that in all the church fathers that I looked at, Chrysostom, Augustine, and Aquinas, they all had Son of God. Um, but in my translation, it's Son of Man. Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who speaks to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this, and they said to him, Are we also blind? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, we see, your guilt remains. All right, let's talk about this for a little bit here. Um, do you believe in the Son of Man? John chapter 14, verse 1. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Okay, so I put our faith in in someone is a very powerful thing to say you can only do that of god okay we put our faith in others but that's not the way we mean faith it's a very huge distinction there okay um when we give honor and devotion to the blessed mother or the saints uh that's far different than the honor devotion adoration and worship that we give to almighty god okay so to put our faith in another human being is uh, totally different than when we mean faith in God. And our Lord in John 14, 1 says, you have faith in God, have faith also in me. He's, he's, he's saying, you know, speaking in a, in, a, in a parallelism here, he's placing faith in him alongside faith in God, okay? Uh, saying these two things are equal. Um, it's another way of saying I am God, okay? Um, because only, one can only put one's faith in God. Period. All right. Now, uh, who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? That is one of the most beautiful things here. Um, this guy whose eyes are open for the first time. Seeing the world around him for the first time. This exhilarating rush that he must be experiencing this incredibly dramatic day of his life, incredibly significant day, the most significant day of his life, total um, life-changing experience, and uh, to say the least, encountering the Son of God. These beautiful words, Who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, you have seen him, and it is he who speaks to you. He said, Lord, I believe. Lord, he calls him Lord. And he worshiped him. Now, I want to just draw some more benefit from this blind man's zeal. This blind man's witness or testimony of boldness and of his love for our Lord. Um. His seeking of our Lord. Who is he? Who is he? Sir. That I may believe in him. He wants to know the Lord. He wants to know the Lord. He wants to know the son of man. He wants to know the son of God. I, I just. I want to dwell on that for a second here. Because you know we know Jesus. How do we know him principally? Those of us who have not 
seen him. Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. Uh, like St. Peter says, you know, you love him, though you do not now see him. You love him, agapate, agapate. Uh, from agape, you know, we love him with this Christian agape love. Um, he says, without having seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with unutterable and exalted joy. St. Peter says this. First Peter chapter 1, verse 8. It's an incredibly beautiful thing. Calls to mind when our Lord asks him at the end of John's gospel three times. Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Um, so, yeah, I... Uh, I just want to dwell on this love, this loving devotion, this this uh, Simon, son of John, sorry, yeah, uh, Simon, son of John. Um, I want to dwell on this because it, it relates to this whole entire Bible study that we're doing here. Uh, how do we get to know the son of God? Uh, primarily, through the record of his words and deeds, precisely what we're doing right now. So I know I'm preaching to the choir here, uh, but let's just reflect on this, shall we? That uh, the catechism is very explicit that uh, if we want to know the Son of Man, and if we want to come to believe in him more, and to come to know him more, then uh, we have to study and ponder the sacred scriptures. Every day we should be studying. I'm in it every day, folks. It's my passion in life. I want it to be all of a, the passion of all of us. Um, the, this is interesting. The phrase, heart of Christ, this is a quote of St. Thomas Aquinas in the Catechism, paragraph 112, cites Aquinas. The phrase, heart of Christ, can refer to sacred scripture, which makes known his heart. Closed before the passion, as the scripture was obscure, but the scripture has been open since the passion. Since those who from then on have understood it, consider and discern in what way the prophecies must be interpreted. So the whole, Old and New Testament ultimately points uh, to Christ. Uh, who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Uh, we want to know who Jesus is. We want to know who the Son of God is. Who the Son of Man is. Paragraph 133 and 134. Listen to this. The church forcefully and specifically exhorts all the Christian faithful to learn the surpassing knowledge of Jesus Christ by frequent reading of the divine scriptures. And then cites St. Jerome, ignorance of the scriptures is ignorance of Christ. So why are we doing this Bible study? We ought to remind ourselves frequently. We're doing it because we want to know Jesus. We want to know the Son of Man. We want to know the Son of God. Who is he that I may believe in him? I want to know who he is. Okay. Uh, ignorance of the scriptures is ignorance of Christ. The church forcefully and specifically exhorts all the Christian faithful, all the Christian faithful, to learn the surpassing knowledge of Jesus Christ. By frequent reading of the divine scriptures, ignorance of the scriptures is ignorance of Christ. Uh, that'll be good enough. Now, I want to read some texts here from St. John Chrysostom because this business of the laziness of Catholics to pick up the 10,000 pound book took me until I was in my mid-twenties uh, before I finally, finally uh, 
started really seriously studying the Bible. Um, I was largely ignorant, folks. Uh, this is uh, back in the mid-90s. So we're talking, it's been 30 years I've been studying the Bible. All right, now, before that, I was very, very ignorant. Typical uh, uh, Catholic. Now, this is no different than the way it was back at the time of St. John Chrysostom in the 4th century in Constantinople where he was bishop. And listen to these words of his. Um, Let us now after this be ashamed and blushed. He's talking about the Samaritan woman at the well. Uh, a woman who had five husbands and who was of Samaria was so eager concerning doctrines that neither the time of day nor her having come for another pur purpose, you know, to the well, and the fact that it's midday, it's hot as blazes, none of that deters her, nor anything else led her away from inquiring on such matters. But we not only do not inquire concerning doctrine, but towards them all our dispositions are careless and indifferent. Therefore, everything is neglected. For which of you, when in his house, takes some Christian book in hand and goes over its contents and searches the scriptures? Instead, he's talking to a lot of rich people in Constantinople. He's the uh, archbishop. They, they tie, listen to this. None can say that he does so. But with most, we shall find draughts and dice. But books, nowhere, except among a few. And even these few have the same dispositions as the many. For they tie up their books and keep them always put away in cases. And all their cares for the fineness of the parchment. And the beauty of the letters, not for reading them. I'm always saying this. And will not cease to say it. Is it not strange that those who sit by the market can tell the names and families and cities of charioteers and dancers and the kinds of power possessed by each and can give exact account of the good or bad qualities of the very horses. But that those who come hither should know nothing of what is done here, but should be ignorant of the number, even of the sacred books. Snap. Now, I might have read that to you before, but he just hammers on this in this chapter uh, nine, uh, his homilies on chapter nine. Uh, same thing. He's he was stirred by the devotion, the uh, sincerity, sincere seeking of the Samaritan woman who made these inquiries uh, to our Lord, inquired about doctrine. She took an interest um, and showed real enthusiasm. And so does this blind man show a certain enthusiasm. Who is he, Lord? We're so, so dense and so lethargic. Um, now, listen to this quote uh, on chapter 9 of John's Gospel regarding the blind man. He says, uh, he's we're talking about his boldness. And he says, we should be able to do this. If we are bold and give heed to the scriptures and hear them not carelessly. Will be bold like this blind man. For if one should come in here regularly, even though he read not at home, if he attends to what is said here, one year even is sufficient to make him well versed in the scriptures, because we do not one day read one kind of scripture and tomorrow another, but they're always the same. Still, such is the wretched disposition of the many that after so much reading, they do not even know the names of the books and are not ashamed. 
nor tremble at entering so carelessly into a place where they may hear God's word. Yet if a harper or dancer or stage player come to the city, they all run eagerly and feel obliged to visit and spend the half of an entire day in attending to him alone. But when God speaks to us by prophets and apostles, we yawn, we scratch ourselves, we are drowsy. One more little bit here. Thus it happens that while we are more skilled than any in these worldly matters, in things necessary, we are more ignorant than children. If you ask them, who was Amos or Obadiah, or what is the number of the prophets or apostles, they cannot even open their mouth. But for horses and charioteers, they sure can. Oh, man. All right. Now, I just thought I would tack on to that a little plug to me in a special way. As a clergyman, I do have a special obligation to be extra familiar with the scriptures, to be a, a, a special student of sacred scripture. In 2 Timothy 2.15, St. Paul says to Timothy, a bishop, and he's referring to him, and this applies to all the clergy who are so often woefully ignorant of the scriptures. Um, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. So look at folks. I mean, the fathers of the church provide the best example. Their zeal for the scriptures is just remarkable. It's unbelievable. Uh, even St. Thomas Aquinas, you know, I just counted up all the texts, all the citations outside of chapter 9, okay, from anywhere in the Bible, Revelation to Genesis, anywhere in between. The guy is all over the place in his commentary just on chapter 9 of John's Gospel. You know how many times he cited the scriptures? Just guess. How about 141 times? And that's only in 29 pages. Now, I say that, but really there's interruptions and half the page is Latin. So it's really much less than that. I would say it's like 13 to 15 pages. Okay. Can you believe that? Cites the scriptures. 141 times. Unbelievable mastery of Scripture, St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, 400 years before the Protestant Reformation. So we got to get this out of our head where we think this is the Protestant thing. They're all wound up about the Bible. No, this is our book. This is a Catholic book. We had this thing in our possession for 16 centuries before the Protestant Reformation. And the early fathers of the church are the best example to us. Their passion and zeal and fervor for the sacred scripture, it's one long running commentary. And in the medieval era as well, okay, I know it tended to uh, be more theological, doctrinal, and we brought back Aristotle, and there was a... Uh, um, there was a ton of commentaries written in the Middle Ages. And St. Thomas Aquinas quotes the scriptures constantly in his Summa Theologica. Yes, it's more philo philosophical, um, you know, but it's incredibly saturated with the Bible. And he considered himself a commentator. First and foremost, Aquinas considered himself a commentator on sacred scripture. So passion and enthusiasm for the word of God is a Catholic thing. We have to bring that back. Ignorance of the scriptures is ignorance of Christ, St. Jerome said. All right, got it out of my system.
And why don't I just read one more little quote here. This is from 19... Uh, this is Pius XII in 1950. Let me double check that. Pius XII, I'm sorry, 1943. And I just want to read one little quote here. He exhorts all the children of the church, especially clerics, to reverence the Holy Scripture, to read it piously and meditate it constantly. That there is no Christian family anymore without them, and that all are accustomed to read and meditate them daily. Daily. All right. Um, so we're getting towards the end here. The the Pharisees are going to say, are we also blind? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry to disappoint. Uh, let's look at uh, some texts here where our Lord says that very same thing in Matthew's gospel here. You know, I mean, you have to be childlike and they're too big for their britches. That's what it boils down to. Uh, these theologians with all their learning, all their great learning. And uh, here's a simple blind man who gets it. It reminds you of our Lord's statement in John or Matthew chapter 11 here, verses 25 and 26. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank thee, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to babes. Yea, Father, for such was thy gracious will. All right. Um, I want to look at a couple other texts regarding blindness and what our Lord has to say about this. Just in the synoptics in Matthew 15, 14, uh, when he's dealing with them, uh, this whole controversy about the washing of hands. Uh, what does our Lord say? Let them alone. They are blind guides. He's referring to the Pharisees who uh, the disciples say, hey, they're, they're offended. When they heard you saying that stuff, they were offended. And our Lord unhesitatingly says, let them alone. They're blind gods. And if a blind man leads a blind man, both will fall into a pit. Okay, and we know he lambastes them uh, in these seven woes in chapter 23 of Matthew's gospel. Uh, let's hear a little bit of that. So verses uh, 16 to 19, he blasts them. Woe to you blind gods. Okay, you blind fools. All right, and he says it again here. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Okay. Um, uh, woe to you, you blind Pharisees. Yeah, he repeatedly tells, you know, hollers at them about their blindness, which is really a lack of faith. That's what we want to see. Uh, what is it? It's a lack of faith. Exactly what we heard in the prologue. He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world knew him not. He came to his own home and his own people received him not. Um, I want to look at John 16, verses 7 to 9. Um, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convince the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they do not believe in me. The Holy Spirit's going to come and convince the world of sin, because they do not believe in me. He came to his own, and they knew him not. Let's look at examples of this in the Old Testament book of Wisdom. For instance, chapter 2, verse 21. Uh, this blindness is ever-present in salvation history. And here it's described by the wicked here who are persecuting the righteous man. Uh, 
Thus they reasoned, but they were led astray, for their wickedness blinded them. Isaiah, always Isaiah, is the bomb. Isaiah 42, uh, 16 to 20. This is incredible here. I will lead the blind in a way they know not. In paths that they have not known, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness before them into light, the rough places into level ground. These are the things I will do, and I will not forsake them. They shall be turned back and utterly put to shame, who trust in graven images, who say to molten images, you are our gods. Hear, you deaf, and look, you blind, that you may see. Who is blind but my servant, or deaf as my messenger whom I send? Who is blind as my dedicated one, or blind as the servant's of the Lord. He sees many things but does not observe them. His ears are open but he does not hear. Okay. So these men, these Pharisees are the servants. They're the elders. They're the dedicated ones, the parashim. And who who's as blind as them? They see many things, but they do not observe them. Who's as blind or as deaf as them? My messengers, my dedicated ones, my servants. Hear you deaf and look you blind that you may see. This is a theme throughout. Throughout Isaiah, this theme comes up again and again. But, uh, you know, here's an example of it also in Jeremiah. Uh, this Isaiah theme that you see here is very interesting. Hear this, O foolish and senseless people who have eyes but see not, who have ears but hear not. Um, that's interesting. That sounds exactly like Isaiah. So it's got to be borrowed from Isaiah by Jeremiah. So um, let's jump back to the Catechism, paragraph 588. These guys, they are responsible and they are even more responsible because to whom more has been given, more will be required. They're the elders, the dedicated ones, the messengers, the servants, okay? Uh, the religious leaders, they've been given more. They see so much, and yet they're the most blind. Luke 12, 47 and 48, to whom more has been given, more will be required, Okay. Uh, paragraph 588 of the Catechism says this, Jesus scandalized the Pharisees by eating with tax collectors and sinners as familiarly as with themselves against those among them who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Jesus affirmed, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He went further by proclaiming before the Pharisees that since sin is universal, those who pretend not to need salvation are blind to themselves. If they go around thinking of themselves, lengthening their tassels and broadening their phylacteries, loving to be greeted in the marketplace and called rabbi and getting the best seats at the dinners and whatever. Um, man, they think, they pretend that they don't need salvation. Lord, I thank thee, like the Pharisee, standing next to the tax collector in Luke 18. Oh, I thank thee that I am not like other men. And I tithe and I fast and all this business. It's bogus, man. It's hypocrisy. If you pretend not to need salvation, you are blind because sin is universal. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, one little final tidbit here I like. The word for blindness, to floss, to floss your teeth. Just think of it that way. Uh, to floss, to floss, okay, is derived from the word to floss without the L, okay? So blindness is to floss in Greek. Uh, smoke is to floss. 
okay? So blindness comes from the word for smoke, something that's smoky or cloudy or obscured from sight, okay? By two foss makes you two floss, okay? I guess what? The word for being puffed up or conceited is an interesting word because there's a certain blindness, okay? When you're puffed up and conceited, a certain blindness settles upon you uh, and you are literally, it's derived from this word to false as well. Smoke, okay? Uh, to foo is to be conceited or puffed up. It's literally to be puffed up with smoke, to have fog on the brain or smoke on the brain. That's a perfect description of these Pharisees. They are conceited or puffed up. So it's interesting. The only place you find this word used in the New Testament is in 1 Timothy by Paul. And it's it's interesting because he warns, he warns, don't choose a neophyte. This is a uh, 1 Timothy 3, 6. Don't choose a new planting is what the word neophyte means. Don't choose a new convert or a new planting, okay, uh, to become a bishop. Don't pick a new guy. You want somebody who's salty, okay, uh, who's been humbled by life and beat up a little bit. Uh, why? Because they might be, they are more likely to become tufu, puffed up with conceit, okay, to get this smoke on the brain. So it's very interesting how physical blindness, tuflos, comes from the word tufos, smoke, as does tufu, this word puffed up or conceited. So these guys see they aren't tuflos, but they are too foo because they got too foss on the brain. All right, folks, the best example we can look at of this whole thing uh, and somebody who is cured of their blindness is St. Paul. He even is made blind uh, when he uh, encounters our Lord. He loses his physical sight uh, and it is restored. Uh, so St. Paul is a great example of a Pharisee, uh, a self-proclaimed Pharisee of Pharisees, uh, who has his sight restored. Uh, until next time, chapter 10, and Jesus the Good Shepherd will be next. So, peace out, and God bless you.